buttoned that up. <laughs> I'm very relaxed, as you can tell. Good stretching. G'day guys, welcome to the latest episode of the ISS podcast. This episode is supporting Swiss Aid, a proactive mental health tool that is built by Out of the Wire Gunfighters for every Australian for free. Go and check it out, uh, swissaid.org. Uh, this thing's fucking amazing. Uh, let's get into the podcast, talking about amazing people. We've got uh, Andrew from Ringers Western, the, uh, the founder. Mate, what have you been doing in the last week? What is going on? Oh, it's been busy, mate. Um, actually, just opened up two stores. So I opened one up in uh, Brisbane at the DFO. Uh, opened up another one down in Harbour Town on the Gold Coast. Oh, you um, got in the DFO, Brizzy? Mm, yeah, so that's been really good, actually. Um, it's busy, very busy. And then, uh, yeah, now we're um, head under toes to bloody get rid of uh, a whole heap of merchandise so we can uh, donate some good funds to Swiss 8. So we've done a really good collaboration with them. Again, um, and this one for Remembrance Day for the barbecue has been fantastic. Like I couldn't be happier with how the designs came out, uh, and in conjunction with everything else. Mate, um, I saw the um, I saw the post, the first post that Grace put out today with the the aprons and the shirts. They look sick. We're about two minutes into a podcast. We might as well start plugging merch. Get onto ringerswestern.com. Is it .com .au or .com? It's .com no, just, just .com. 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 Yeah. Ringerswestern.com. Check it out. There's some sick merch in there, and they are donating cash. No, it's, it's been uh, it's been very good. We um, you know, Mate, we, I couldn't I couldn't believe it. I saw I saw two chicks riding down the side of the highway down here at Shaw Road, where you park your ringers trailer, um, and two cowgirls riding. I don't. I'm assuming cowgirls, if you're allowed to call them that, <laughs> riding horses wearing ringers t-shirts. It's it's the same thing. Hey, when you look for yellow cars, you see them. Um, yeah. mate, your ringers merch is going crazy in North Queensland. Yeah, we've been lucky. So we. You know, it's, I guess, kind of the way that we've gone about the business structure is, you know, we've gone into a lot of sponsorships with, say, the Brisbane Broncos or NRL players uh, at the Cowboys. Um, uh, we just signed on with the Gold Coast Titans um, and we've also signed a contract now with Queensland Rugby Union for the entire state, not just the Reds. So that's a huge one um, that we've set up. And then I guess from the way that we've built, you know, strong relationships within defence and also out of defence too. So, you know, that goes same with, you know, the relationships we build with sport or with um, reporters or really with anyone. Like our brand is so flexible to to all demographics of society. So, you know, whether you're at the pub or you're in a suit, we counter for everything. And, uh, you know, we actually just dropped our uh, our sandals today. Um, they've been flying out the door. Are these, uh, we, are these the Birkenstock-esque? They are. Well, they're not, but they are ours, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah just promoting like, direct competitors, mate. It's all no, good. no, no. I bought a pair of Birkenstocks and I was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about it. Mate, if you don't mind, um, before we get into where Ringers is at now and, and kind of the marketing strategy behind it, because obviously it's, it's blown up quickly and – I don't know if you consider you well, if you call yourself a veteran-owned business or not, but there's only a handful of veteran-owned businesses out there that have really gone from zero to hero in a couple of years, and Ringers has been fucking exploding. Yeah. Take take as long as you want with this one. Can you give us the story of where this all started and how it all kicked off? Yeah, mate, absolutely. So um, it's quite a, quite an interesting story. Basically, um, I had just done selection down in Perth, Um and I had uh, about two weeks before selection, I had my appendix cut out. Um, and then oh. I, it was actually three weeks before that, I had my appendix cut out. And then I hadn't done the ASFET. It was actually I meant to do it the day after um, I had the operation. So then I just called them up and said, look, I, unfortunately, I've just come off, uh, just come out of surgery and I'm not going to be able to do it. And then two weeks later, um, one of the, one of the woes there gave me a bell and says, well, we're actually running an SVET if you want to come down to Sydney and jump on. And then the course starts in a week. So I was like, you know what, fuck it. Like I, I trained hard enough for a, a good year to do it. Um, went down to Sydney, um, did that and got through it and then went over to Perth um, where I met a, a good mate of mine, um, Gareth Shrub, who's a um, also started a clothing brand. Um, and we did the course together. Um, when I went back to his place, um, actually after the SVET, he had a bit of a clothing brand in there um, and I was asking questions about how that works and what happens with it, et cetera. Didn't really think too much else from there. When I did selection, I just ruptured um, something from the operation 
and uh, and then had to come off. Um, then went back to uh, my family's cattle station at the time, and uh, we're all sitting around a fire just after a day mustering. And um, basically, you know, I was just saying like, oh, you know, my shirt. I had an R and Williams shirt and was ripped, and I was like, oh, I wonder how hard it is to kind of make make clothes like this. Yeah, what do you do? Um, and then all the rest of the guys that were there were saying, I don't know, we we'll just let's give it a shot and see. So basically, um, the rest is history. Kind of packed up. I went down to the Gold Coast, made a heap of designs, and um, and then jumped in a four wheel drive, started driving around Australia and um, selling clothes at little events and things like that. Um, my mum was packing out orders at the time, and then um, and then my partner at the time, Anika, who's you know we're not together now, but she's still heavily involved in the business. Um, we, yeah, she came down, was doing our customer service and basically we went, this is five years ago, we went from, you know, her to her to, you know, then hiring staff and now we've got about 85 staff here. Um, we've got over 250 wholesalers around Australia. We have about 15 around the world wholesalers um, where, you know, we internationally sell, you know, hundreds of orders every day all over the world. You do well overseas? I would imagine yeah, we, you would, mate. Yeah. yeah. We do. We actually do really, really well in New Zealand, obviously. Um, the United States is massive, Canada. Um, and then we do, like, it's bizarre, like France, Germany, United Kingdom. We sell heaps over to France. Um, still? Still, even after the last couple of weeks? I thought the French hate us at the moment. No, nah, they're actually right? probably buying it. They're buying more now because we're in the news, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're probably like Australia. Half the country hates their prime minister or their president, whatever they call him. So if he says... Turn against Australia, they all turn around and go, no, let's start buying more of this yeah, stuff. Exa- exactly right. So then we did that and obviously um, through the way the brand's kind of evolved, we're, it's it's not – the brand's not considered, you know, mine or anybody else's. It's it's the people's. Um, and I think if we have that, we've had that attitude all along, then we're able to kind of get away from what we think someone wants to find out what they actually want and then make that. Um, and that's what's worked well, you know, like – uh, Adrian, you've given some examples of the board shorts that you liked and then we whipped those up. Um, mm. And then we've done the same thing for your company as well. Um, and that's that's worked well. So if we kind of had that attitude with it and get away from ourselves, then, yeah, it's, we're in a pretty lucky position. Yeah, man, I, th- I think that's something I've got to work on too. And I, I know it's the same with a lot of um, – I mean, the charity's been very different, but, but businesses I've had in the past, it was very much – this I, I was trying to make a product that I liked, and yeah, w- unless you test it with your audience, you, you're like you might have one customer, and that's going to be yourself, and your business isn't going to make any money. Yeah, um, exactly. So, mate, going. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm looking at Max, and he's got a question, just like about about like escape. I'm like, I just want to break it down a, a bit more. If if any of this stuff that you don't want to talk about, because there's IP or, or super secrets to scaling business, we we yeah. can deflect, but. Um, I just saw having you on here, we can get into a bunch of other stuff later, but there is so many veterans out there. There's so many young people out there at the moment that just want to start businesses and, and, and yeah. the rag trade is obviously a hot topic and a lot of people fail because it is getting saturated. Um, if I can just pick steps through from what you've just said, when, when you said you, you, you're you sitting on the cattle station and you're like, oh, let's make a product and you went back, you went home and, and, and mocked up some designs. How many? So all the information I've read or have read in the past, I've never been in the e-commerce space, but it's always been find one flagship product, make sure that works, and then start adding to your range. Is that how you kicked off, or did you make a few things? Yeah. So basically, like I literally had no idea, and I'm not computer savvy whatsoever either. So you know, I I just got in touch with a couple of people down in Sydney and and kind of asked like, can you guys print t-shirts and hats? Um, you know, we came up with the name Ringers Western. Had the bull because that's a photo of a bull that we had. Edited it up, um, and then I just went for the logo straight away. And I thought, well, we're not going to put massive overheads into the business. So that was the fundamental first thing that we focused on, and we haven't stopped on that principle the whole way through. Is manage your overheads, manage that properly. If you don't, you know, you're going to design the best website, you're going to do all this thing, you're going to spend all this money, but you have nothing, and you have no product yet. And you just spent all this money, and so right now you're you're so far in debt, and that weighs down on you. It doesn't matter what anybody says; it does. It, it weighs down on you. And if you think, "Oh, I've got so much money in the bank from all the other jobs I've done," it's fake news because that's not corresponding to down on the planet what you actually have. The business now has twenty grand in debt. That's what we started with because we bought the clothes. The website was a Shopify basic website, you know, um, 
and then we developed that that component there. Um, I had family and friends that were assisting the whole time through and coming up with everything else as well. Um, came up with the products and just kind of just I just pumped Instagram though. That that was a fundamental thing. Build a huge audience on that on, on that, and then just sharing and tagging and doing all the things that are whatever. But that's it was twenty four seven. So it's all right for people to come in and say, you know, I'm going to start the business and do that, but I still want my social life. I still want to do all those things. Okay, it doesn't work like that. It, it, it may for other people, but from what I've found and what I've observed for everybody else along the way, those who will succeed are the ones who are going to stay committed and follow it through. If you don't do that, then you're going to have a lot of trouble. And then customer service. doesn't matter what industry you're in. If we are not good at that, then we will fail. Mm. And that no, same thing in the army. Agree. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So what was um, my? Sorry, I've got fucking so many questions coming out of my brain at the moment. Um, the the family part. Having so, I had this actual this exact conversation with with my brother this morning. So Ben, if you don't know Ben, my brother is our CTO uh, at Swiss Eight. Um, and we've done a few things in the past together, but it's always felt when I've had startups. I wore, say if there was 10 hats that we needed, 10, 10 positions we needed to fill, I'd do nine of them and Ben would do one. And then over, as he got older, I mean, this is when he was 19 yep. when we first started our first thing. Um, but but the, the biggest failing that I've, or the biggest lesson I learned from my, my first business was you physically cannot do it all yourself. So when you're starting a new thing, you, you must have people around you that are going to chip in. <laughs> You, you just said then, you touched on it a few times, you had the, the boys out on the property and you said you had family, you had the, the ex-missus doing a bunch of stuff. How, how pivotal was that to have a support network passionately involved in the business when it was starting out? Oh, it was it was instrumental. Like my mum was in there writing every order out and sending them through. So then I was on the ground just being able to sell products and events and then build the brand externally to that. So, you know, if, if I've got to worry and, and micromanage what's happening down that space, I mean, firstly, I understood she understood my intent and was able to execute that exactly in her, in her way. And that was perfect. Um, now, if, um, like, if I had to do that, then I would drop off the main thing that I'm doing being the front and selling at the events and all those things that are there. I mean, if we're not real, then it won't work as well. Mm. So I have to be the brand as anybody else who's working in it has to represent them and go through. Otherwise you're, you know, you're just like a telemarketer calling from overseas who's got no compassion or understanding for the person they're dealing with. Mate, we figured that out, like trying to do social media when we started because um, I, I don't know, speaking about agents, the same as well, like getting in front of a camera on social media, I was like, fuck, this is gross. And then yeah. you try to talk how you think people want to hear you and then you spend, and I've spent three years, trying to formulate a, and be professional about it and it just was never me and it was the hardest thing you could do on the planet. And then yeah. up until about probably a month ago, I was like, I just won't get nervous and just be me and send it. And it's gone well, mate. So Yeah. No, it's exactly right. Like, and I, I mean, there's so many different lessons and everything that come through. And I know like Sats, you know, you're someone who wears your heart on your sleeve at times, right? Very um, much always, mate. Always, yeah. We're about, so, you're, we're about to find out. Give, give me another 10 minutes and we'll start talking about generals in defence and people will see hard on hard on your sleeve firsthand. Yeah. So I've I've found it, um, you know, all the, way, all the way through when we're doing things is that um, like uh, if, if I, if everybody's my boss, then it's going to be a lot easier for me to direct events there because we're coming into a situation where I'm not saying, Max, go and do that. Adrian, you go and do that from there. I'm like, we're coming in. Okay, this is what we need to achieve, guys, and how do we go about executing that? And don't get me wrong, like when people need to be told what to do, we'll do that. But it's a different attitude of saying something with it because we want everybody to take ownership of this business. So we have 85 employees who all individually own it. We have such a low attrition rate of staff. You know, we had a staff member who was my first employee ever. She left about six months ago. And because uh, she wanted, she you know, she almost had enough. She wanted to go and do some other things. Okay, within four days, she caught up and said she made a huge mistake. And can we have her back? And she came back straight away. We've got it. So it's it's you know where the business is announced. If we have that, then everyone's going to take that through. And I'm not there dictating what's happening. We're we're there trying to get out the best product and find out what they want. Mm. No, I absolutely agree. And and 
I mean, that that's something that we're starting to see over the last five and 10 years in, in the tech space, predominantly coming down from Google and Facebook and the big tech companies saying that you must, you, you, you cannot be a dictatorship. You can't tell, just give orders. Um, you need to invite or encourage innovation and encourage out of the box thinking from every single person, from your software engineers all the way down to people in your warehouse. Give them objectives and then see yeah. what they come back with. That being said, this is a this is a tough one for me because I have found that it seems like a fantastic way to think for companies with a billion dollars in the bank. Um, with the ability to lay people off and make people redundant and, and move through staff if they don't find the right people. I have struggled, and, and this is something we, we're doing pretty good at the moment because we have a very small team and we have found we, – we've gone through a few staff last year. Shit happens. The, we, we have got people working inside Swiss 8 now that are passionately, like emotionally involved in, in where we're going, and that's yeah. fantastic. But I still struggle personally, and I know Max does too um, – when we go, all right, this per- these people are passionately involved, but we need to get more out of them uh, in a week. Um, now, before before we go into that one, how how do you how stringent is your recruiting process? Do you do you do a lot of weeding out before you bring people in? Um, to be fair, we don't. We probably don't really like. I guess the kind of the way we pick our staff is just based on a feeling. You know, they come in, we have a chat, and. We pretty much just say yes all the time anyway. We're really bad at that. We just say yes and then do it. Um, but we've been we've been lucky with it. You know, I, I didn't do a business plan. I didn't do any of those things. We we just had the idea and we kind of wing it. And we're still doing that today. Um, you know, we kind of run off ideas and then just innovate through there off. It might be the dumbest thing. Like we made these uh, flamingo work shirts, right? And everyone's like, it's pretty shit. But you know, turned over half a million dollars. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not bad. Pretty shit idea. Yeah. So we try and try and do that. And uh, I, I guess you get a feeling of the people that we employ. And if it looks like they've, they've got the basic understanding of doing that job, then we got we really haven't said no to anyone. Anyone. Would you say you recruit based on, on, on a cultural fit rather than a, a yeah, resume? 100%. So they ha- they, you, have to fit in, you have to fit into the company. Um, and to get the most out of out of our staff is one, if they can do my job better than me, they can have it. No, no worries at all. And we've had people have come in down in the warehouse picking, and then now she's a corporate account manager. Um, all the staff get paid above the award wage, well and truly, for that. Oh, your audio has just dropped. Down here on the planet, it is practical. So you have to. Like, you know, to keep, like, I can go to the army, right? In my class that I, when I went through, we had some frigging jets and then we had some amazing lemons. It's interesting to see that the lemons are the ones who are now in charge and all the jets are out running businesses or doing other stuff. <laughs> like so, oh, mate. So we- I'm, and I, I don't even get me started on that because I, I, I'm find, going it, to. I find it incredible how, you you have to buy your time to do all these things. When we know that that guy was a terrible lieutenant, he was a terrible platoon commander, he was a terrible captain, but he was he was really good at you know his administration or just just surviving until all the other people left. And then by default, he's now lieutenant colonel at this battalion there. And then why is it that he gets sacked because he hasn't worked with people managing soldiers, understanding the principle of that you're not a dictator, mate. You are there to serve your subordinates, not the other way around. Um, so we emphasise that. So everybody thinks that they can get there. If someone can do it faster than me and better than me, they can have it right away. Um, and Fuck, then they, they job, take mate. it. Yeah. But that's that's if how we turn, do it. If you turn rations into shit long enough, you get hooked. Yeah. yeah. So hey, we had, me and Max had this exact conversation this morning when we were venting behind closed doors about about upper middle management within defense um we won't go too far into it because i know we there's a bit on the line for us at the moment we don't want to piss off too many people but at the end of the day uh, some of this stuff has to come out especially with the royal commission coming up but the end statement that came out was well let's be honest the people who make it to the top of the food chain in defense generally are left standing because everybody else got jack of it <laughs> it's, there's, a, I mean, there's outliers. There's a couple of generals that I we we know or high ranking dudes we know at the moment that are genuinely good at their job, but a lot of the rest of them, 
they're very good grey men and they they don't make political mistakes and that's why they end up in the top job. And yeah, yeah. do you know what? Do you know what's what's got me fucked at the moment? And this is what it is. So <clears throat> we've had conversations at the highest level of government, and it's greenlit, right? We we greenlit some things. And then at the digger, the lowest level, the lowest common denominator where we all come from, uh, me and Sada anyway, like, you know, <clears throat> greenlit. And then we get up through the ranks, unit level, we're good to go. And then it's sort of stopped at brigade. We're like, okay, what's going on? And then it sort of never trickled down. Uh, and then we figured out, okay, someone's a little bit annoyed and the generals club, the ex-generals club got involved. Um, and I, you, do you know when it, when you're a digger and you look in and you never get to see behind the green curtain when you're when you're a digger and as you go through the ranks, lance corporal, corporal, sergeant, the the curtain just gets pulled aside a little bit more and more. And I thought I'd seen enough of the curtain behind the curtain, like I know how this fucking thing works. Uh, turns out, um, yeah, probably when I was a digger, I had more understanding than I do now. And that is, <laughs> you know, this this there's an, there's a generals club and um, yeah, very perplexed by the outcome of it. Yeah, well, I, I, I always think like you've got a soldier or, you know, an officer for that matter as well who he might have been amazing at his job, okay. Um, he's done his command. Now he's going to be a captain. Is he going to spend six years rotating through moving his family and house every two years, right, on less than $120,000 a year um, for what? For what? Hmm. Like, okay, we're saving, he's going to do a great purpose, but he might just be going and doing an admin role for something else or doing this. But, like, there's there's not enough capability. for. He's going to say, I'm going to be a CEO in another 10 years' time that he's going to pay all his dues for when this guy has the most amazing capability to be, you know, the CEO of BHP or, um, you know, like operations manager on half a million dollars for, you know, for huge companies. And they can do that. And they mm. do do that, and that's why we find our situation. Yeah, the good one, the good ones get out. I mean, from what I've seen, anyway, um, within OR ranks, it's it's kind of well. I mean, diggers can go ahead and do anything, to be honest. But um, within OR ranks, people reach uh, section commander and sergeant, and then they're like, "All right, I've done my bit. I've seen enough. I need to go and explore my future potential in life." And with officers, it's like. Um, I'm sure there's lieutenants that do a bit of stuff and then get out, but captains to major is kind of maybe, and, and lieutenant colonel is kind of that rank where you're like, if you stay around that long, you probably want to be institutionalised for life, and you might not have aspirations to do anything as a civvy. But captains and, and and majors tend tend to spear off and become high speed leaders in in the corporate space. But then you go, and again, I I, I don't want to talk out of school and just shit on generals for the sake of it, but we got a platform, we might as well. If you've been in the military for that long and you've been following one set of rules for so long and and you've done 30 to 40 years to get to the point of being a general, I, I completely understand defence contractors like like Boeing and, and Raytheon and, and, and whatever else, Ryan Mattel, pulling those generals out and going, hey, we're going to give you a board seat because you can open doors in Canberra. That makes sense. But what skill set does that general have to push drive that, that that company forward from a, a, a kind of governance standpoint, I can't see it. Maybe maybe I'm missing something, but I, I can't see the value they're bringing other than opening doors in Canberra and and, and getting the generals club. But again, yeah. I'm, I'm very biased at the moment. So yeah. Well uh, look, I think don't get me wrong, like you have we have some amazing generals that have come through there and and you know like CEOs or colonels or brigadiers as the list can go on. And and if some of them, when they're in a wartime theatre, are unbelievable. Like they have truly stepped into that space and they come back out and things change or they go, you know, they go to different different roles. But I think um, we probably don't put enough emphasis on the people and training that. Like we follow this book, this doctrine, which is great, but I think we have to understand that when we're dealing with people, like it, we can get a lot more out of people by understanding uh practically and that's how we gain from civvy life not being so regimented understanding that you know shit happens you know we've got to deal with you know when we're mustering cattle like there never goes to plan we always have to adapt and overcome our the what we're doing like and if i'm designing products or we're selling clothes or we're doing certain things you know sometimes things work sometimes they don't but how fast can we react to solve a problem and then maneuver through to something else um there's always a way with it but 
I, I feel like, you know, we could go on for hours and hours talking about those things. But mm. I mean, we're, I'm a mere ant in a, in a giant mound here for, for this. It's well above my pay grade, I guess. That's how. That's well, no, I mean, I guess, I mean, there is, oh, we will move on to the 500 other questions I've got. But just to wrap this one up, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing, the reason I jumped into this kind of train of conversation now is, is from what I gab, gathered from your first kind of spiel about where Ring has started and where you came from. The two biggest things that you, you you touched on were the culture of your team and customer service. So essentially, you consider the human element internally in your team and the human element, what are your customers saying and what do they need before anything else, before before you, you're worrying about building websites and bottom lines and, and stuff like that. And I just think that is a lesson that defense leadership right. can, okay. can okay. take away. I've got a good situation for you then, all right? So every single day at lunchtime, we have a toolbox where we get together. Now, any person in that whole room can raise something with anybody and keep them accountable to what we follow with it. Now, so for instance, if I, if I have a coffee and I leave the machine on and, and then I don't clean up the mess there, the person who's picking and packing the orders can say, hey, Andrew, you know, we've got a rule that this is in place and then you haven't done that. So just think about it. When you're the lowest person there holding the boss accountable, how does that make you feel? It, it makes them feel like they're safe, okay? Now, in, in the military organisation, do you think that me as a junior lieutenant could say to the general, sir, I just wanted to check my perception on this situation and find out if, if this is actually accurate. Mate, I'd be in the brig and I'd be in fucking not going anywhere, okay? Because that, that, as much as I say, yeah, we're accountable to it, we're not. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, we're not being insubordinate. We're trying to enhance our leaders to be better. If my subordinates feel like they can do that, then we'll be better. And that's 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 how we've always operated through our business. Yeah, I think that's that. It follows that rule of you can have an opposing idea to your boss. So, and, and um, just you don't have to be subservient or a sycophant. You can be subordinate, but that doesn't mean you can't have an opposing idea and be like. Boss, that's a fucking shit idea because of this, right? And then go, yeah, yeah cool. And then they go, you can't say that. I'm a yeah. – I'd never – I had section commanders that be like, they'll run it, they'll run it in. We're setting gun lines and we'll set, we'll set grounds up for a gun line. They're like, dude, that is a fucking shit spot for a gun line. And I'm like, yeah, no, nah, good call. We'll pull, we'll pull, it, we'll pull <laughs> it, it back it, 10 metres, right? Like, But some no, of them it, flip and they're it, like, they can't talk. You can't do that. No, and don't get me wrong. Like, they have to do it in, in – good taste and respect to the person's position. Like if I was going to talk to a general, he's, he's earned that position. Don't get me wrong. He has because the society says that. And I think that as well. So now I've got to say, if I, there's a way for me to raise that with him and say, sir, with all due respect, I'm thinking this. And these are the reasons why. If he says, no, go and do that. No worries. I'll go back and do that because I've still got to, like if the staff member doesn't agree with something, he's still got to do it or he can't work here. It's, we're not like, mm. we've got to be running a business still. But we want to be open to gaining as much information about our business as possible. And that's that's what we find is the one really good way to do it. Love was there it. ever was there ever a point where during the, the growth of ringers where you're like, fuck it, close the doors, uh, this is not working out? And and was is there one you can share that is where you're like, nah, we are done? Or was it just smooth sailing and upward? No, we've been pretty lucky with it. We've been pretty lucky with the whole way through, really. Like yeah, just the business is done. We've just kept on producing good products. And, um, you know, when we when times are a little bit tough, we got a good contract to just give us a boost up. So, you know, and then and then something else happened and it just gave us another boost up. So kind of feel keep doing the right thing and it'll work out. We've stayed in our lane. That That's a good one. Is there, has there ever been a product or a, an idea that you've had where you're like, this is a, this is a game changer, it's going to be amazing, and then it shit the bed? Um, no, nah, I was worried. About that. I was, <laughs> Ringers is just the ultimate company. No, I was wor- really worried about boots for a long time, um, about how that would work and what would happen with that. Um, because we invested so much money into it and the development of it all. So I was, I was yeah, quite nervous in regards to, to that component. But, and everybody said, you know, all these other brands have done it and failed. And we were like, you know what? Fuck it. If it doesn't work, then we've got plenty of boots for the family to use for the rest of their life. So who cares? And it's only money. Like we're not concerned whether wingers goes up or falls down because 
as long as we stay together and our company and our family does the right thing, then that's all that matters. I'm not, we're not concerned with the irrelevant shadows that kind of hit us. And then the boots are going well? Yeah, boots are going really well now. Mate, they're you sick got a, boots. You got a they are sick boots. And I think the timing was fucking perfect, whether it was deliberate or you just came up with the concept. Because when, when, um, I don't know if you, you dislike using competitors' names on podcasts, but I've actually just had gone blank. What what is the that boot company that went to New York? They they left a gap in the market, right? Because they was like they were making Aussie Aussie dude boots, yeah. and then they went to New York, and I'm like, uh, they're a little bit fancy for me now. And they like what like six hundred bucks for a pair of yeah, yeah ankle cut yeah. boots. I'm like, no 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 no, that's not for me. No no, that's right. So like, Aaron Williams is such a good company, amazing. So. Kind of like they um, obviously sold out to Louis Vuitton, and then there was a little bit of a gap in the market there. So we um, we that's when we thought, well, we can just jump in and have a shot in that space there. And there's room for everybody. Don't get me wrong, um, but yeah, their their boots are amazing. They're priced at I think six ninety five or something, and we just made a very similar boot um, for three fifty retail. So that works. It's, yeah, it's not too bad. Mate, bad. Aussie blokes, even, and I don't, I don't know what it is. You can probably give us some insight to this, but for me, it was, I, I think, Cowboy Cerrone and then yeah. Yellowstone, the TV show. That was when I was like, ooh, Cowboys are cool again. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm an adult and I had no interest in Cowboy shit at all. Yeah. Um, and this was, this is, <laughs> it's not a fanboy story, but it kind of sounds like one. Um, this is before me and you knew each other, Andrew, and, and, and the boys um, from the army were like, oh, you got to, we, we know a couple of boys that have started wearing this ringers stuff and we started paying attention to it. Um, at the same time, Cowboy Cerrone's in a bunch of fights, um, Yellowstone's kicking off, and I'm like, well, this actually might be something I could get into. And, I, and then I saw you come out with boots and stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have to start dressing like a cowboy. I haven't gone completely into the cowboy style yet, but I think there's room to move. Yeah, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. What are the rules? What are the rules behind cowboy gear? you got a uh, – got a. A mate, he's got a um, – his partner's a vet. He's got a couple of horses. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get some uh, get some cowboy boots because they're fucking sick. And she's like, you can't. You don't ride a horse. I'm like, I can sit on one, but pretty well. But look, Is there rules in the business, mate? For for us with it, like we're, like I'm completely anti that with it because we've had some amazing people come out mustering that have never seen cows before and they were sportsmen, right, or army guys. They come out helping the yards. They naturally were, were got, had got it. And then you get country people who come out and all they do is polish the rail because they're perif- petrified of bloody the cows chasing. So, mm. like, just anyone can do what they want. Like, this is a problem that I'm finding with Australia at the moment is that we're just trying to dictate to people what they can and can't do, and it's disgusting. How about you just let people be free, and if they want to wear country gear, they can. If they want to wear city gear, let them do that. If they want to wear surfing clothes, let them do that. Absolutely, I agree, mate. I um, but I mean, this conversation came up for us when were we in when were we in Byron Bay, Max? Was it started like this is before COVID kicked Just off, before the storm, before people, before the media started this COVID pandemic? Um, we were in January, February, or something last. In, we're in Byron Bay, and we we're like, Byron Bay has because I grew up as a kid in in Newcastle, going to Byron Bay for holidays, and yeah, and and back then, like I'm thirty six tomorrow. Ooh, fuck. Um, I, I grew up going to Byron Bay, and Byron Bay back in the day had legitimate hippies, like legit yeah. hippies. Not so much anymore. It's rich people who wear hippie costumes. And we went to Byron Bay two years ago, and we're like, all the all the hippie shops are selling these costumes, and people are rocking up in their fucking Porsches and, and BMW four wheel drives straight from Sydney, jumping out in their Byron Bay costume. I'm like, you're playing dress up. Because you are not the person who fits that <laughs> style of clothes, and then that, that that concept kind of stuck in my head when I started wearing ringers gear. And, I'm, and then we went to Darwin um, end of last year we were in Darwin and met Nab like, and he's yeah. the Australian cowboy. He's a proper country boy, and I'm like, proper. Oh, I, I just got caught out because I'm playing dress ups, <laughs> and this dude's actually legit. Uh, he's a hundred percent. That was a good trip. That one. Holy it was sick. Yeah, but that I mean that. I agree. Anyone can wear whatever they want, but there is an element of fashion for – well, not fashion, but but certain types of clothing fit a certain style of person, and a lot of the time people dress up to what they want to be. And, then they, again, that's fine. Um, yeah. I just don't want to be a Sydney eastern suburbs housewife playing hippie for a weekend 
I don't, I don't want that feeling when I'm wearing ringers gear. So I'm going to have to do a little bit more, more manly <laughs> shit next time I'm playing dress up. We make the rugged work gear for the station and then we make gear relative for the city. And then we make gear relative for bloody getting on an aeroplane and flying away. We make mm. surfing gear. We make um, board shorts. Um, so we're, we've got everything and plenty of fishing gear too. So we really, like our brand will diversify into multiple arms. So you might have a, a hunting range. You might have a corporate range. Um, not you might. We will have a hunting range. We have a corporate range and we have a casual range. We have a workwear range and we have even one for tradies. So we are just keep doing that, I guess. It's working, mate. It's working. Because you've got um... – because we engaged Norforce, uh, you've had a fair bit to do in Norforce across the top, or your family. Yeah. That. We engaged yeah, a couple yeah. of stations there. That's crazy. And and we sat down on a um, uh, we got to the Alice Springs Depot. We we sat in there for the Fink, and that was That's our good, staging. Man. Yeah, it was brilliant, mate. And they put us up, um, and and that really helped us out shooting the Fink doco. Yeah. Um, but just getting in and talking to the guys and the and just the the dramas that yeah. You know, these local blokes want to do to try and get in and serve the community. Yeah. It's Did you have like much it, to do with North Force across the top end when you – Yeah, I was in North Force. I was actually a survival instructor at North Force. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the one of the best jobs I ever had in the Army actually. So um, my whole – my you know, being a troop commander up there and then running survival, I was one of the first uh, officers qualified in the RPC, the new regional patrol craft. So, you know, obviously everyone has issues with officers doing anything, but – it was pretty good. True. <laughs> Got amongst it. I can catch a fish, I tell you that. <laughs> so when you say you're a survival instructor, you uh, watched a section commander give survival instruction course information or no? <laughs> no. Yeah, well, literally, but uh, he did at the time. Um, and then, yes, you have to do the course, obviously, and then from there um, you, you got to obviously practically apply it for, I don't know, it was one or two years and then, I went and did the instructor's course and then I instructed on courses after that. And um, awesome. It's one of the one of the environmental survival component of what we do is just incredible. I couldn't couldn't recommend it better for anybody else. Mate, this, might, um, I, might I forget you do some programs in the app, mate. Jump on and uh, even take some guys away. Is there still yeah. a lot of local knowledge from the land with the, with the local lads? Yeah, there is, but it's pretty hard to find. It's few and far between really. Like – Say like Navzi is an example. He's a survival instructor. He'd be perfect for you. You know, he's still serving in Norforce now. Um, he he would be perfect to do that. Like, because he is, he's been practically doing it now, like every, every year, and he's daily improving his craft about that. Mate, I, I saw him. I mean, I, I tracked him on Instagram. He's he's one of the best people to follow on Instagram because it's not it's not packaged no, bullshit it's content. Just, it's just him. There's a dude, I, I don't know his name, I don't want to rag on people. There's a dude who goes around with a GoPro and, and like, saves turtles and, and does a bunch of shit. And I'm like, that is as staged as it gets. And then you watch Nav and you're like, no, th- he, he was just walking in the bush and accidentally came across a snake or a croc or whatever yeah. it was. Like, it's it's legit. And I agree, man. I reckon we should tee something up next year with, with him to get up there, Max, and get up to Darwin. And, or where, it's WA. Where, where's yeah, he? WA. He's up in Tanganara in the Kimberley. Yeah. Mate, that'd be sick for the app. Absolutely. The, the on the North Force stuff though, like I, I did a bit of reserve time when I first when I got out, and there was always North Force trips coming up saying that, that we they needed more numbers and we can go and do them. A lot of the boys were hesitant, going, "Nah, that's that's um, it, it's not going to be fun." And then I started looking at when we went to the, the Fink last year, and I started seeing what North Force actually does. They're pretty much on deployment all year Consistent. round. Yeah, hundred percent. It's sick. And if, and if you're yeah, if you're a Choco out there listening or a reservist out there listening to this now, definitely put your hand up for North Force trips. They look good. Yeah, and you just you're on you're operating autonomously. You know, we're not doing these lock stats every hour on the half hour or whatever. Like you actually, you get your mission, you execute it through, and then you just do your reports. You know, whatever timings that are required now. But you know, it's like once a day, and you're out there doing a job. You're running an OP. You're then, you know, setting scenarios and you're coming. It's just incredible. And you're going through a complex environment. Remember the heat, the crocodiles, like everything else that's involved in there. It's not – it's it's situations which are not uh, ideal and that's why it's cool. Uh, and looking at the uh, runways, um, I'm sort of feeling that 19 – well, I don't know what year we're in now but compared to – correct, incorrect. I know what year we're in now but 
in reference to drug running from Colombian cartels using small airstrips to get into America, this is one of the things that's happening in the Northern Territory now, isn't it? Like patrolling airfields and watching drug planes flying in. Like there's some real shit happening right now. Yeah, well, I mean, I, again, I'm not, I'm not current with everything that's going on at the moment, but, I mean, those, those are the things that we have to monitor. Um, when we are doing the, when we were doing the jobs back when I was there and running through, and then we'll we'll do um, a lot of our tasks or our missions are done in conjunction with um, uh, ABF, so the Australian Border Forces and the Federal Police. So you know we might have they they'll have some information. We've got to set up an OP. Uh, we'll have a direct line of communication to them, and then we just let them know what we've seen, and then they'll pull their trigger to go in and collect or whatever has to happen. Mm. Mate, but sounds it's, good. That uh, certainly is. Well, there's got to be, me. And again, like I, I'm talking completely out of my lane here, but you would assume with the, the amount of travel and trade restrictions through COVID, the one thing that doesn't stop is the black market. They're going to find a way in. Yeah. And Australia's a pretty big spot. Northern Western Australia, Northern Territory, you can land planes in there without getting caught pretty of course easily. You can. Yeah, but I mean, think about it. If you, I don't know what the... Uh, I can't recall exactly how many nautical miles between our waters and sovereign waters start, or what. Um, but you get a mother vessel that just you know hangs off there, just fishing, whatever, and they send off their little um, their tender vessels through. Um, you know, it's not too far for them just to come into our waters, drop off a you know a nice little package to a combi van that happens to be taking some scenic photos, and off you go. So oh. you know. So you, you have done a business plan. You didn't do one for ringers, but you may have done one for drug trafficking in the Northern Territory. We've, we've done some things that come through. So <laughs> yeah. hold, hold on two seconds. You're all right, mate. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, so that's um, that's part of our situation. Just just to give a scale of how big Australia is, the, the your um, station in Kununurra, how big is it? Oh, the one we did have was a million acres. That, not anymore? No, not anymore. Oh, what so, happened to so, it? No, I sold it. Uh, we sold the lease about eight years ago, six years ago. Yeah. A million acres, one property, a million yeah. acres. My, what, does that look like, stations. what does that look like geographic? like if we're going to put a country inside that? I don't know what's the size of Scotland or Wales or something like that. Oh, is mate, it- this is worth googling. All right, it's got to be bigger than New Zealand, surely. No, nah, no, nah, no, nah, no way. No, nah. you got you'll be all over that stuff. And hence, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to put money on. It's got to be Scotland. I reckon Scotland. No, nah, it's not coming up in first we, Google. We need Therefore, a better Jamie. We 100 need, need a Jamie. Just pull it up. We can always edit it back in later and sound really smart <laughs> and go, yeah, no, it's this big. That's massive, though. That's massive. I mean, I'm, I, I, I am a, a massive introvert, as most people know. I do love the idea of getting a property and, and just moving off grid. Yeah. I was. I, I used to look at it as like a down the track kind of thing. Um, now, with what's going on in the world, I want it to be tomorrow. I actually yeah. just bought this place. Um, it's an empty block of land on the Hawkesbury. It's only it's only like fifteen hundred square meters, but it's on the Hawkesbury River, and you can either drive two and a half hours in the middle of nowhere around a few rivers to get to it, where no one does, or you can go up the river on a boat to get to it. And it's no power, no water. I'm like, that's the dream for me. How at the moment. good! Oh. I just want to get away from people, mate. It's 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 a thing at the moment, like. Oh, I've had enough of them, yeah. especially I, right now. Look, I, I have an interesting question that's posed to me quite a lot, right? So we have all these military, um, and I know I spoke to you about it before, Suts too, like you have all these ex-military charities that are popping up now all the time, as an example. Um, and then you guys, will get, you guys have all got into a room before I take it to try and solve a problem, like when you go down to Canberra or... Oh, not with the other charities. Like that was part of this barbecue campaign. Our, our mission, one of the one of the key objectives for this campaign was to unite some of the smaller ex service organisations because the big ones don't want to play nice. They they want to monopolise and they want to divide and segregate and and get political grant complete saturation in coverage. A lot of the smaller ones just want to work together, and so we are slowly making that yeah. happen. But we're not we're not there yet. Yeah, I, I just think it's so important to do. Like 
I don't know if I mentioned it, but like uh, it would have been probably eight or nine years ago when I was a, at the RSL in Kananara. I, I actually became president of the RSL. I love that. Yeah. I actually was the president there. And, and then suddenly I'm looking at like our bank balance and and then the money that's gone out. And it's like we've got so much money and nothing's actually been done. And then I'm looking at this chap who's wheeling in in a wheelchair that's fucking broken. I'm like, let's buy him a wheelchair. Like he's an ex-serving veteran. He's served in Vietnam. What are we doing? Like, and then, and and then the more I dig, the more I see that that's nationally that it's people are reporting and think it's really good that we've got all the money in the bank, but like our veterans have got nothing. Like, mate, that, no that, it, it, it's a problem, I mean, and that is why. I, I again, I, I don't want to go pointing the fucking spear at too many organisations, but there is. RSLs, I, I've tried for the last few years, like I, I'm the treasurer at Coogee and our sub-branch is starting to make progress. It's taken two years, but we're starting to make progress. RSL New South Wales, they really want to do the right thing. They're just hamstrung by their – the way their, their governance and their structure was set up 100 years ago is, is a really bad fit for 2021. It, it yeah. just doesn't work. And the, the, I mean, they've got no money, RSL New South Wales headquarters. All the sub-branches have got all the cash and they're just run by these old dudes who aren't willing to spend it. Um, and they've got their own reasons. It's not that they don't want to help people. They just don't know how or they come from a generation where yeah. you stick all your money under the mattress and you don't spend it, whereas now we want to spend it. And we finally got to the point with Coogee. Coogee's got like three million bucks in the bank and we're one of the smaller ones. And I said like when we, me and a few of the younger boys came in and we're like every meeting was – what what do we want to invest in next week? And I'm like, you fuck. It. Well, no, I didn't didn't swear it. And I was like, you old fella, you you're not stockbrokers. You're not head fund hedge fund managers. You are here to spend that money, not not to give it to a fund manager. They'll make money for you because that's what they do for a living. We should just focus on spending it. And finally, like we had a meeting on the weekend, and finally we're at the point now where we're going to build a website and just put up an EOI form that says, if you're a veteran and you have got an idea, let us hear it. We'll give you money for it. Um, and and awesome. it's the first time in, in in RSL history that that's happened. It's and awesome. while I'm on while I'm on a soapbox, I've got to have a stab at RSL Queensland. They're probably going to get a shut down for this single comment. They've got the art union, right? They make a hundred and thirty million dollars a year net. I'll, I'll actually let's let's just I'll just say one hundred and thirty mil because I need, I haven't seen the, the full set of their books, but there's one hundred and thirty million dollars a year coming into RSL Queensland from the art union alone. Every civilian in Australia thinks when they buy an art union raffle ticket, that goes to their local sub-branch. It doesn't. It goes to Queensland. Queensland RSL is also the largest recipient of DVA grants out of any ex-service organisation in Australia. That means they've got a $130 million business model and they're still soaking up all the DVA money. Now, you ask any veteran in, in Queensland how many times they've been helped by the RSL, and I've asked a lot of veterans, and the answer is always never. Now I it's know nothing. they do some. They do. They do some stuff. I'm sure they do. I hope they do. Um, they do a few good things, but a lot of their money goes on lobbying Canberra and 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 writing new grants for next year, and it's gross, mate. And like you said, like you're a young bloke, you go into a sub branch and you're like, we've got money, buy that dude a wheelchair. It's, yeah. it's a no brainer for young people because we're not trying to treat this as it's our own little slush <laughs> fund. No, we just want to no. spend it. It's time for change, mate. There, there's a lot of young ex-service. I mean, this this little passage of conversation kicked off because we were talking about the few ESOs that have set up these retreats and these these places around Australia to, to get yeah. off grid, and they need money, and and um, they're not getting any because obviously veterans don't want to pay to do anything. They they want to go right. and do stuff for free, which is another problem. But there, there's 130 million bucks there from Queensland RSL that could be going to support some of these yeah. dudes that are, that have set up these camps. Yeah, that's right. And I think, um, yeah, there is this, there is a lot of work to do, but it still starts with just picking up a stone and moving it. Um, Correct. You know, like um, get out of bed, make your bed, get back to work, like improve your health like that fundamentally. You know, we've all gone through things like that where we kind of lose our purpose or do certain things. But, you know, I know I've had a number of ex-servicemen working here. Some have lasted, some haven't, and that's not due to us. It's due to them not being able to kind of get through what they want. Did you have yeah. a? I mean, I don't know your your story, your transition story, out and and this is pretty powerful because we we I, I spoke to Dan Pronk and um, we had him on the podcast and listened to their books. 
they sort of they really went downhill. They didn't. They thought they were, you know, sh- they were okay. They knew there was some fucking squeaky wheels, but it wasn't until some of these dudes transitioned they were like, the wheels fucking fell off the bus, and they were like, holy shit! And it really took them. Is this something that happened with you, or did you, I mean, you set yourself up probably? Not really. I mean, like, I, most of my time was spent. Um, if I wasn't deployed, then I was I was in the reserves. Um, so a lot of my time was, you know, even if I was CFTS, like I'd had a lot of cultural bring up, uh, being brought up through, you know, my civilian capability too. So, and I, I was always someone who had multiple things happening at the same time. Um, so I, I never really went into that that space, I guess. So when, well, I mean, when, what you've just said then, that that is a, a, an attribute of high performing people is is almost what they classify as ADD or ADHD without the the craziness as a kid, but constantly doing things i've found for myself that that i realized now looking back was a great deflection technique when i didn't want to process a few emotions that i didn't understand um would you would you say that that staying busy is because you you, you need to be busy or would you say that staying busy is, is, is something that you value as a positive in your life um I want to answer that with a question. When you when you were deployed, right, out of, say, the 50 people that were around you, you tell me one person that was depressed in that trip. No, ever. None, not one, okay? Now you get back here and they lost their purpose and they're like, oh, it's too hard to get out of bed. Mate, get the fuck out of bed and go and do your job. You don't have time to be depressed. I, I like it. I like it. And that's – that's well, finding new purposes is obviously one of the big things that we – Kind of try and talk to people about going. The military is a great sense of purpose, and and that's instilled in people through recruiting. And then when you leave, you you don't have that. No. Um, don't and, get and me wrong. Like I don't. Um, I, it still happens to me where I think, oh, you know, it's a hard day. I've got some bad news or some other things. Like I feel bad. I have to say, no. You've got to get up. You've got to keep moving. Otherwise, you know what happens. We all know what happens. It just pours on top of you. And in the weight, it's like, okay, I'm gonna put five kilos on your chest now. And then in an hour, I'm going to put another five kilos and another five. Before you know it, you can't get up. You don't have it. And I still go through those things all the time, but I've got to quickly hit them. I've got to hit them so it doesn't exist. I've got to move it. Movement, mate. Movement physically and mentally, it's essential to human performance. Absolutely. Seems like a good segue. What is the daily routine of Andrew McDonald? Oh, mate, so right now I'll get up in the morning um i'll just do some stretches and some exercise and then either head to the beach to just jump in the water and then jump out um head into the office by that's 6 30 um and then try and push push through whether i've got meetings or other stuff that goes on um and then try and uh generally i have to send my pa to pick up the kids and then take them to training and then i'll meet them at training so i try and get there about 4.35 every day. So my son does Muay Thai and he's, um, he's a pretty big fighter at the moment. And then my daughter comes and just does that. So we'll go and do training for every afternoon. Uh, if we don't do that, then we'll always do exercise together. So let's try and make sure they'll do that every day. Good routine. Good routine. You're in the office at 6.30 every morning. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> Good. Good. I find that's, that's a, that's a re- you- yeah, where you fall, like you, you go, yep, I missed that one. Do you, because I've heard ways of, of people saying, okay, I dropped that hurdle today. Like, yeah, maybe I didn't get the training session this morning. Uh, are you more onto the, where you will self-correct? Like what's your internal Dude, dialogue, uh, negative oh, channel? You just go, you don't write the no. day off. You go, right, let's try and fix this now. No, I just do it and try and do the one percent is right. You know, like turn the coffee machine off, clean up the mess. Make sure my books are neat. Make sure that I'm doing the clean the emails. Just otherwise, it just builds up, you know. And I, I don't have the capacity to to clean that up. So, just keep trying to do those, you know, those one percenters every day, and you know, throughout the day, and and don't look too far ahead because it can get overwhelming. Um, and then just try and catch the ball and and then throw it again. See what happens. Mate, what have you got Pretty coming much. up? What what's uh, what's happening with oh, Rangers? We've got- so we've got our Boxing Day sale coming up on uh, sorry Black Friday where we're going to do like an offer, buy one pair of boots, get another pair free for Black Friday and then we'll have a big sale on Boxing Day. But um, we've actually started another business it's called um, Cowboy Up Hard Lemonade. So it's an alcoholic lemonade. Um, so that's now, yeah, selling pubs, bottle shops, et cetera. 
Um, got yeah, you can find it on Instagram. Um, it's pretty good. It tastes like lemon squash, except it's four percent. Um, so I've got that, and I'll have a lager coming out after that. Um, and uh, again, low overheads, um, good clean product. Just let it roll. Was that it's a beer? You said you bring it. Well, sorry, what was the brand name? It's called Cowboy Up Hard Lemonade. Ooh. That is mint. That is spot on, mate. <laughs> Too bad you've just given up drinking, Max. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, we, we will be making a zero alcohol one as well. Yeah, yeah no. that's um, we'll, we'll edit that bit out, mate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so, what uh, you said a lager as well. So, you're going into beer as well. Yeah. Same, same brand, same label. Yeah. Cowboy Up Beer Co. Yeah, I don't know if I've got a oh, mate. Yeah, good. Oh, yeah. We were, um, while, while we've got you recording, mate, we were in the market for a beer sponsor. How's that? Oh, that get that into it. First, that could be the first sponsorship for the podcast, mate. Yeah, indeed. Get some, um, get some down to you. It's literally, it tastes, it just tastes like lemon squash. It's, it's bloody, and it's raw yeah, that sugar. That sounds lemons. like, is it, Cowboy is it, up, have you, have you tried like to go it. healthy with it or is yeah. it, yeah. But it's still got sugar. But it's it's raw sugar. Um, we're not going down the set slow like that type of thing at the moment. But it's just keep it real and give it to whoever wants to drink it. Cowboy up, mate. <laughs> that will, mate. That is hard lemonade. I think everyone's gonna want to drink it, mate. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not too bad. Again, it's just ideas that we have and shoot them if they work. Great. Might as well. You got to have a crack, mate, with no fear of failure. No. What did you do with these? Um, I mean, did COVID affect the boot supply, clothes supply? Like, you can't buy a car in Australia at the moment. I know that's because no. we're off built off. So it's true, it did. But when it first happened, we just went harder and spent more and got more. So it kind of didn't pull back. We just went harder, and we're in a really good position, strong position now. It did it? Did it? Reflect with Ringers the same way it did with most of you, like the big, a lot of smaller e-commerce kind of brands were, were struggling, but the big ones seemed to no, we do pretty well. Yeah, we, we went well. Yeah, it was, yeah, we were lucky. We were able to, you know, keep all our staff and employ more staff. That's, that's oh, how good how it was. Good. Yeah, so we're how lucky. good. Then. Well, when the Australian government's just printing fake money and giving everyone money to stay at home and do nothing, they might as well spend it on clothing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. But don't get me wrong; like we give, we give a lot back. So, um, you know, we're about to do a, a obviously with you guys all the time. I think we donated what fifty thousand or what are we oh, donating to you? For Anzac Day, we'll have to double, mate. That was too far ago. My um, brain cells are, are in Remembrance Day mode at the moment, but it was a big one. It was good, and it was much appreciated. Um, well, then we're doing one for Ronald McDonald House. So that's you know an amazing organisation which puts. Um, Families up in uh, Ronald McDonald House, like a hotel, while their their children are receiving um, medical care at a hospital. Um, oh, nice. So we've we've got a, a work shirt with Sandra writing a book coming out shortly for that. Hopefully, we'll raise over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to donate to them. So all profits go to them. Yeah, um, nice. You know, and then we help with the drought, we help with the fire. So whatever happens, we're there to give back through. Yeah, no, it's it's great, mate. Uh, and and most companies these days, like if you if you don't have a CSR focus, then you you kind of it's obvious that you're just in it to get yourself rich and then and then get out. Um, yeah. and I think Ringers has been have well, they been getting their ass kicked they, from day one. What are we coming to now? El Nino, yeah, El Nino. Which one is it? Well, we eaves right. Well, I've got no idea where you're jumping to. Mate. Cycle, what are you talking about? There's a seven year weather cycle, right? Where you get seven years of drought, seven years of rain. I think the rain came last year, so yeah, it'd be and like everything. Pump it in. Are the it's, farmers still? Are they struggling now? Still? Oh, just because one area gets rain. This we're, we're still in Australia, mate. We we have huge areas that are going to be ravaged by drought consistently all the time. So you know, and even if it does rain a heap, it doesn't rain for six months, they're they're going to be in drought again. So it's it's you know just understanding that basically, just because it rains doesn't mean the whole of Australia is out of drought. Mm. Yeah, if I'm, we're actually we're looking at some stuff. Uh, our, our, one of our main focus next year will be to do these educational courses delivered by veterans to not just resilience, but but just holistic health and, and well being. And and a lot of the focus of from the initial interest that, um, messaging that we pushed out, and even with government funding where it's coming from, a lot of the focus is around um, farming and, and regional Australia for mental health because drought 
<laughs> if you're a farmer and you've, you're second, third, fourth, fifth generation and you're on, on properties and you've had nothing but drought for the last 10, 15 years, how you are yeah. still stable and not and not in a pit of depression is beyond me. Exactly right. They yeah, build them exactly. tough. They build yep. them tough in country Australia, but still everyone's got their breaking point. And so that'll be part of our focus next year to do some stuff. I mean, we've actually been talking about because the stomp got cancelled. I don't know if you were... Why do yeah. you know? Yeah, we're going to do this walk around Australia. Thank fuck that got cancelled from COVID because that would have meant we had to walk thirteen thousand k's. Um, but it's it's been like gnawing at me in the background for a year and a half. Going, we had this whole thing logistically mapped. We have to go and do it now. So we think rather than walking at the moment because it's still too in the, up in the air, we might put together a, a road show around Australia next year with with a few of our partners, going to a few talks and, and a few kind of things with mental health kind of events for, for regional yeah. Australia. Yeah, that'd be perfect. So I'll let you know, mate. It'll, we'll be coming through Ringer's territory for sure. Yeah, well, I think we'll be able to send some people on there and some of our ambassadors for sure to jump on with you. That would be awesome. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, mate, mate I don't know what's uh, what's coming up. We, we we got the Black Friday sales. Is it Black Friday? Yeah, Black Friday. So that that's just a quick one for, um, yeah, buy one pair of boots, get one free is what we'll do for that one. And then we have a huge sale for Boxing Day. So we only do two sales a year. It's just uh, Boxing Day and then June, July. And if anyone's listening right now, get to ringerswestern.com and buy a bloody apron or a barbecue shirt. What do we got left? Six days? Seven days? What day is it? Day? Yeah, oh, it's a week. Well, We're a week it's, away. It's a week. Seven days. This will come out on Monday, um, hopefully, yes, Monday. And so if you're listening to this on Monday onwards, 11th of November is Remembrance Day. I don't care what you're doing. If you listen to this podcast, you better be bloody pausing at 11 o'clock. Otherwise, unsubscribe and never talk to us again. Uh, it's Remembrance <laughs> Day, Thursday, the 11th of November. Um, there's barbecues all around Australia and definitely get to ringers.com, ringerswestern.com and, and buy a shirt. Um all the proceeds going to Swiss Eight, thankfully, to to support veterans and all Aussies' mental health. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Thanks for coming on. I know you're. You, I know you're busy. Um, no, mate, mate anytime. Thanks for supporting us, mate. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll keep you posted and uh, hope to get you back on in the future if you have got any crazy things happening. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Look forward to it. We need to do a podcast. Sorry, before you hang up, Max, we need to do a podcast live from one of your properties, mate, when we get a few boys around. Yeah, 100%. Do some hunting. Te- we'll get the teach me how to wrangle cattle or ra- yeah. whatever you, what do you ring them or I don't even know the words, mate. I yeah. just wear the outfit. We'll um, get some of the um, footy boys out there. That'd be good. Fucking oath. Yeah, that'd be yeah. sick. Yeah. That'd be sick. No, Go. All right. Thanks, Cheers, guys. Mate, mate. Take care. Okay. Catch you.